So I'm going to click it right now. Click. Wait, we still have a little bit of rattle, of background rattling. But it's from me. Okay. And I clicked it and we are live. Hello, everyone. Today is Wednesday, April 6th. And I am going to make this sentence last as long as I can until it is five o'clock on the dot. And it's still going, but <laughs> we are live. Welcome. We are here with Marcy Wheeler and Ben Benjamin Wittes. And we are about to have a bring back our delightful pugilism week. And Ben, why don't you give us a little introduction into how you and Marcy came to have a lovely debate today? Yeah, so uh, first of all, uh, welcome to uh, Marcy Wheeler, AKA Empty Wheel, as I sometimes call her, Dr. Wheel. Um, uh, uh, so first of all, let me say a couple words about Marcy. Marcy is uh, an icon of Pugilism Week. She is... Uh, uh, a, a longtime uh, legal blogger on matters, national security, federal investigations. Uh, uh, she uh, uh, used to be, I would say, uh, a frequent antagonist of the lawfare crowd during, uh, during the uh, early part of the Obama administration. Uh, uh, I find uh, she was always had an enormous amount of insight into uh, documents, into all kinds of things, and was delighted uh, in the uh, beginning of the uh, late part of the Obama administration and early part of the Trump administration to find uh, that she was uh, uh, quite uh, passionate and, uh, in my view, uh, 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 incredibly uh, insightful and high value about matters related to uh, Trump and Russia. Um, and uh, I think was extremely courageous on those issues, just in uh, being direct, honest, and doing what she had always done, that is to say, analyze documents and uh, try to figure out where investigations were going. Um, uh, the other day, uh, I wrote a piece about uh, some uh, uh, OLC opinions that are of little interest to very many people, except people who follow the Mueller investigation extremely carefully. I did not expect this piece to particularly antagonize uh, Marcy, but it did. And Marcy uh, wrote a number of tweets suggesting that I had not adequately read the public record uh, or I could never suggest uh, some of the things that I was suggesting in that piece. We had a rather sharp Twitter exchange, uh, and I thought that this was would be better handled with an in-person discussion. So uh, I invited her on the show to have that discussion, and as a mark of my deep respect, put on not just a dog shirt, but <laughs> fluffy poodle shirt, which I don't do for just anybody. Uh, so Marcy, welcome to the show. This is formal wear, Marcy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, I should say and explain why I'm such a jerk on Twitter about these issues and not just to Ben. And it's that there are there, there's an entire sub industry of people going on TV. I call them TV lawyers. Um, and regardless of what Stance they're taking on the January 6th investigation, they're kind of flying blind. In other words, like there's, you know, for, for months they were like, well, can we charge Trump with incitement? I'm like, guys, uh, DOJ is going to charge him if they do with obstruction of the vote count. Look, look here. And I started saying that in maybe April and did an obnoxious post in August saying it's going to be, it's going to be um, obstruction of the vote count. And then in December, Liz, Liz Cheney said obstruction of the vote count. And everyone's like, wow, Liz Cheney's a genius. <laughs> and, then, and now now judges are saying it would be obstruction of the vote count. And I'm like, oh, well, thanks. But, the, but, but one of the issues is that this investigation is so enormous 
-hmm. And the visible parts of the investigation for so long were just the trespassers. And it really has fed, I think, impatience among people who are anxious to hold Trump accountable. And I think that that doesn't understand how DOJ has been approaching this investigation. So that's why I'm such an asshole on Twitter about these things. Now, thank you for the little um, beginning part. Now, but Marcy, I would love to ask, now what is the case against Ben's article specifically and what did he get wrong? Well, I, I you know, we can get into the OSM memos, which I think is important. The question of what kind of obstruction you could charge a then sitting president with. Um, I think the quick answer to that is, uh, if you look in Judge Mehta's decision on the on the Benny Thompson lawsuit, you know he basically says this is an attack on on a different branch of government. This is um, there, there are a couple of places where people say you know the president has no job in the certification of the vote count. So um, it's not quite the same thing as saying this is something that the president can be charged for, but it is something saying that the other branch of government is the one who is in charge. And for you to come in and say, I'm going to take over, um, I think is, is, is ridiculous. Now, we can come back to, I think, and we probably will, to Carl Nichols's opinion, um, the Clarence Thomas appointee, who is the only judge so far in the DC circuit who has not bought the treatment of obstruction of the vote count that DOJ is, is applying to it. But um, I think my my larger issue is that not just Ben, but virtually everyone, because the January 6th committee investigation is public, you can see what's going on. They're doing a tremendous job of working the press. Those are the people we want to see in gallows. Um, there is an impatience to see that be the January 6th investigation that DOJ is doing. And I think that that fundamentally, I mean, A, it fundamentally misunderstands that DOJ needs to have probable cause before they can open an investigation to somebody. So while DOJ could say, we're opening investigation into the vote certifications, because that's clearly, you know, probable cause that a crime was committed. It's not clear that Peter Navarro com committed a crime. What he did was horrible, right? What he did was, set up a way for congressmen to um, vote against the election, but that's not necessarily a crime. There's a lot of people who were involved in all of, I mean, it's, it's not clear at all that Trump trying to install Jeffrey Clark, we've been through this, right? Over and over again, you can, you can install whoever you want if you're president. It's, you know, and, and even if he's just saying, well, it's Jeffrey Clark and we, we're doing it for, for vote count, um, that still is in the area of presidential authority, whereas every single person who was in the Capitol that day trespassed at a minimum, every single person. And so very early on, Christopher Ray was like, look, you know, we're going to start with the people who all broke, who all committed crimes. And there's trespassing. There's the obstruction crime that we talked about. There's conspiracies. There's assaults. There is... Um, doing damage, doing more than a thousand dollars of damage to the Capitol, which in some cases, in the cases of the uh, of the, the, the militias, is being treated as a terrorism enhancement, is being treated. So, so from very early on, this was a terrorism investigation. It just, that also hasn't gotten a lot of attention. And so there's your predication. DOJ needed that predication to be able to work their way up. And I, as I think we'll get into, DOJ, um, if the, so if you are investigating the president for obstruction of the vote count, you have to look at what obstructed the vote count. And what obstructed the vote count wasn't Peter Navarro's work. It wasn't John Eastman's crazy law theory. Um, it was 2,000 Trump bodies in the Capitol. That is the, that is the loaded gun that Trump pointed at democracy, is that mob of people. And so to understand Trump's actions in terms of obstruction of the vote count, you have to understand how, how that mob, uh, Trump's role in getting that mob to the Capitol, Trump's role in encouraging the violence, Trump's role in coordinating with the militias, which is parts of the investigation that aren't yet public, but I think will be, um, from what I understand, is gonna be very inflammatory. Um, 
how Trump asked Alex Jones to bring the mob. I mean, one of the things that's remarkable about the investigation that, that we now know is that the Proud Boys kick off the riot while Trump is still speaking. They kick off the riot so that the riot happens at a particular time for the vote certification, right? So the riot is started. They break through three barricades really quickly, I think more quickly than they thought. And if you read the uh, Matthew Green statement of offense, the one over Proud Boy cooperator, he describes that then the Proud Boy leadership steps away from the riot. They step back. They let the normies, as they call them, continue to assault the cops, but they just sit there and wait. And they are waiting for Alex Jones to arrive with thousands more bodies. They're literally waiting there for Alex Jones to bring all of these unwitting trespassers down to the Capitol. Mm -hmm. And then Alex Jones, and he did this by saying, you know, Trump is gonna be there with us. So there are, there are hundreds of people whose statement of offenses already say, I didn't plan on going to the Capitol, but Trump told me to, so I did. So I followed Alex Jones to the Capitol. And then we know that Alex Jones arrived at the northwest corner of the Capitol where the Proud Boys were already um, like very, very um, remarkably well. I mean, cause there's a lot of military officers, right? Joe Biggs is a staff sergeant. He's the one leading this whole thing. He's a staff sergeant. Um, but so as the Proud Boys are turning this mob into an organized assault on the Capitol, Alex Jones shows up, northwest corner, the Proud Boys, there's all these assaults going on. Alex Jones says, I'm gonna to go to the east side of the Capitol where I have a permit to speak. And Trump is going to speak. He tells them Trump is going to speak. He doesn't go to his permitted stage. He walks like Pied Piper. He walks to the top of the east stairs and guess who he meets at the top of the east stairs? He meets Joe Biggs, who used to work for Alex Jones. He meets the Oath Keepers. So you've got Alex Jones, Ali Alexander, meeting the two militias at the east front of the Capitol, and they very quickly, uh, the door is open from the inside, right? But then they very quickly basically open a second front to the assault on the Capitol, um, using Alex Jones lying to all these people. I mean, there, there again, there are these wonderful statements of, my, one of my favorite statements of offense is for a woman named Stacy Getzinger, who in real time posted on Facebook saying, you know, we followed Alex Jones to the Capitol and he promised us that Trump would speak on the east side of the Capitol. So we followed him to the top of the east steps. And then all of a sudden we were part of that mob and they entered the Capitol and they were part of being what overwhelmed the, the cops. And so what DOJ is doing, A, is understanding what I just told you about the Proud Boys and mm -hmm. waiting for Alex Jones and the second front and, um, you know, we we and how that guy knew to open the door from the inside he was getting tips from somebody upstairs um that's one thing that doj has spent the year doing is understanding tactically how this mob was mobilized but the other thing that they've been doing is they've been collecting evidence of all of these mobsters saying this is how i responded to trump people okay. you know people repeating trump's attacks on pence at the riot I mean, at the rally and then at the riot, then repeating the attack on Pence. So, you, you, you know, that's what they've been laying out. Right. So, uh, Scott, please go ahead with your question. So I just want to say, uh, first of all, that was just spellbinding. But just just as just in terms of what you all the facts you just marshaled and how you put them together. But Ben, why do you deny all that? So I actually don't deny any of that. What? 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 I uh, no. Of course, I. I that, that was. That was. Um, that was to set up. <laughs> yeah. Like, where, yeah. where, so where do you disagree? Saying, Marcy, give yeah. that a chance. <laughs> so I, I think. Um, first of all, I want to emphasize the major area of agreement here, um, which, uh, on which, to the extent that anybody dissents from Marcy's point of view, I actually want to just side with Marcy. Um, so part of Marcy's war over the last few years has to get been to get people to look beyond the uh, the observation that nobody has frog marched Donald Trump out of Mar-a-Lago and put him in a federal court yet, and therefore say, uh, "Oh, Merrick Garland's clearly not doing anything," 
And, you know, Marcy spends her time actually watching the investigation in detail, kind of from the ground up, and she sees what the investigation actually does. Um, uh, and I, on this point, by the way, Merrick Garland backs her up. So if you if you listen to uh, Garland's speech from January 5th or 6th, I forget which it was, uh, he lays out their activity. He sounds like a Marcy Wheeler post. Uh, you know, don't ask why we haven't indicted the people at the top yet. That's not the way federal investigations work. We start with the simple cases. We, you know, and so uh, to the extent that her, her I, I would like to think I am not guilty of this, but to the extent that her general criticism of a lot of people on television is, hey, you're not actually looking at the investigation. You're looking at the things the investigation hasn't done. I actually agree with that pretty completely. I think where I disagree with Marcy is in some of the inferential conclusions she draws about the investigation um, based on the set of things that she observes. And I want to flag a few of them. Um, mm -hmm. One is the issue that we argued about, which is, can we really say that this is an investigation of Trump? Or is this an investigation of a crime that may or may not yet involve Donald Trump's personal behavior individually? Marcy is much more confident than I am that, that this is ultimately an investigation of Donald Trump. Uh, so that's thing number one. But wait, can I interrupt and say- wait, can, I, can, I I just, can I just throw out two other right. things? Yeah, but, okay. But the, se the second is that um, I think Marcy is much more apt than I am to see a unifying conspiracy. Uh, and I, I, I'm not, again, just to be clear, because I don't want to sound like I'm casting aspersions. When I say conspiracy here, I mean in the language of conspiracy law, not that she's a conspiracy theorist. Um, there's a bunch of conspiracies charged. We got an Oath mm -hmm. Keepers conspiracy. We got a Proud Boys conspiracy. Mm -hmm. We've got, uh, and one question that I think probably separates us is whether you see these as interlocking conspiracies that, you know, that, so should you look at each of these cases that's charged where there's a statement of fact that says, I think the president, you know, called me to do this as gathering evidence against former President Trump, or should you see these as discrete cases that may or may not go in that direction? I think Marcy's more apt than I am to draw connective tissue between cases. And then the third area um, is, I, I think Marcy is much more apt than I am to take evidence that was, get, that was gathered, directed against somebody like Rudy Giuliani, process that was delivered to somebody other than Trump around Trump, and see it as an effort to gather information on Trump. Whereas I take a subpoena in a Rudy Giuliani case kind of as a subpoena in a Rudy Giuliani case. So I, I think, and I, and I think if I can argue the other side for a minute, I think what Marcy blames me for, and I'll let her speak for herself, is not being more aggressive than I am in drawing, in drawing similar uh, uh, connections between what I think of as presumptively isolated cases. Okay, so I'm gonna, I wrote these down, so I'm gonna take them one by one because I want Marcy a chance to respond to each. So the first point that Ben made was, can we say that the, this is an investigation of a Trump or of a series of the crime itself? Marcy, please respond. Yeah, I actually would prefer to say it the way you say it, Ben. Um, I think that this is an investigation of a crime and one of the things that I'm frustrated with is people believe that if there is an investigation of Trump, it must be a separate investigation, a separate grand jury, a separate, you know, something distinct. And there not only is that a faulty assumption, because again, the 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 gun that Trump shot at democracy was that mob. 
So you cannot separate Trump's, uh, Trump's exposure, whether or not they're going to get to Trump. You cannot separate that from the mob. You can never prosecute Trump separate from the mob because the mob was the weapon he used. So that's, okay, but can, can I just yeah. can I just poke at that a little bit and, and yeah. see because we may be very very much in the same place then. So right. do, do you is your view? So I look at it and say, hey, there's been no subpoenas that we know of to Trump. There's been no you know there's been no uh, process directed against him. It's specifically there's been no we haven't seen the people around him dragged in front of a grand jury to testify about his conduct. Usually that's a sign that they have not crossed a threshold that said, okay, we're, and I think there are a lot of good reasons for that maybe, um, but that there's a threshold that hasn't been crossed. Is your view that that threshold has been crossed? He's a subject of the investigation or are we basically, or, or or do you agree with me that, okay, there's a general investigation of the crime, he's at some level and ultimately a subject, but we haven't crossed the subject threshold for him yet? Um, I'm certain he's a subject. And, you know, uh, um, and, and I, will, I will say a couple of things. One is that um, Reggie Walton issued an opinion in the trial of uh, Dustin Thompson the other day. Dustin Thompson was the first and most aggressive January 6th. He's, he's charged with, um, he's one of the peaceful obstruction charges, although he made threats before he went in. Um, but he filmed himself ransacking the, parliamentar the parliamentarian's office. So it's almost very symbolic that they charged him with obstruction. Mm -hmm. Then he stole a coat rack and basically told the cops that he'd stolen this coat rack. I so, always take a re coat rack. When really I, stupid when guy. I, when I he, ransack a, 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 <laughs> I mean, a house they, they were for Where Uber. else would he you hang his, your dog shirt? He, he and his co-defendant <laughs> were waiting for an Uber and the cop says, you got to leave. This is, this. we've shut down the Capitol. So Dustin Thompson st stands up and picks up his coat rack that says parliamentarian on it and starts walking away. <laughs> the cop, so not a bright guy, but he wants, he, he claimed he wanted to call Trump as a witness because he wanted to get to all of the back room stuff that everyone wants to investigate. And Reggie Walton said, no, you know, if, if, Trump's, if Trump influenced you, if you believe that you had the authority to go to the White to, to the Capitol and assault it because of what Trump said, you can only bring in as evidence what, what you heard Trump say. And so- Right, but that's not evidence of what the Justice Department thinks. That's evidence of what Reggie Walton thinks. Yeah, but you know the the government certainly made that argument and won with Reggie Walton. I mean, Reggie Walton didn't just decide out of the blue that he wasn't going to let this guy call uh, call Trump. And and DOJ has been making that argument, but it makes sense if the idea is that Trump mobilized this mob, and and it wasn't all overt. There are people, and this is why you have to go through the militias. Um, but, uh, I mean, there are, there are two or three kinds of people. There are the people who are tied to a militia who, who were in fact conspiring with at least Roger Stone and, you know, Roger Stone, Alex Jones, Ali Alexander was working like this with, with the militias in Florida. I mean, the militias, both militias, Proud Boys and Oath Keepers, like in Florida, probably at an event with Roger Stone said, we've got an alliance working towards January 6th. And of course, Roger Stone has ties to these people going way back. So, and as I said, used to, you know, used to employ uh, Joe Biggs. So there are people who actually are in what we would call a conspiracy with Trump through Alex Jones, through Roger Stone, through Rudy Giuliani. So Rudy I, Giuliani I don't, is, I don't doubt that. Right. As a, as a, objective matter of reality. Right. I do not see evidence that the investigation is looking at that. Okay. Uh, at, the interlock you... at the interlocking. And I and I do and I and I kind of want to push you on why why if Trump is a subject of the investigation, is there no effort that we are that we have visibility into to collect information from or 
uh, for, you know, to, to get witness statements from the people around him, to, to do any of the things that you would associate with an investigation of this magnitude and seriousness? Two things. One is um, in a completely unrelated case, at a Mueller referral actually, in Tom Barak's case yesterday, DOJ revealed that they are collecting information about against Barack and not yet charged co-conspirators who look a lot like Steve Bannon from the archives. So they charged, this was a referral from, from, um, from Mueller. They couldn't charge Barack until after Barr was gone. They charged him in July. And then since July, they have been conducting an investigation until into not yet charged co-conspirators with Barack. And Bannon is described as one of those co-conspirators in Barack's existing indictment. Um, and Paul Manafort is described as somebody who was part of the conspiracy. His actions in the indictment are time barred. But it's but not no a January 6th case. Right. OK. But that says that DOJ can go to the archives to get evidence. And so, is and 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 has been doing it without any notice. Now, one of the things that Merrick Garland did is he got Joe Biden to waive privilege on anything having to do with January 6 for mm -hmm. January 6 committee. But now that he has waived privilege for an unrelated for 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 a co-equal branch of government, now that he has waived that privilege, that means that privilege is waived for DOJ as well. So anything that's at the archives is basically in DOJ custody already. Um, most of the most important witnesses, because of the way Pence is at the center of this, like you know, the one of the key one of the key points, and this is where Eastman actually does come into it, is is this was part of the mob was was an effort to occupy the Capitol and prevent prevent the actual vote certification to go on. Part of it was to threaten members of Congress so that they would um, not do what they were obliged to do. But part of it was to threaten Mike Pence. This was a mm -hmm. continuation of what we know is pressure going on um, in the days leading up to the riot. Um, and, a, and a continuation arising right out of Trump saying, you know, Mike Pence didn't do his job. Um, but th that means those witnesses about how Pence was being pressured are people like Greg Jacob who we know testified to the January 6th committee, people like Keith Kellogg, who heard Trump say the night before the riot, imagine if you could mobilize this mob, right? In right. almost but, an erotic sense. So those people we know would testify and would not tell you about it. Okay, right. so Ben, please re reply. Yeah, so I, look, I just want to flash back a few years to the Mueller investigation. Right. What did it look like when the Mueller investigation was investigating Donald Trump? First of all, uh, all the people like that spent quality time with Bob Mueller and their lawyers immediately leaked it. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, we very quickly found out that Don McGahn had spent, you know, 30 hours <laughs> with Bob Mueller, right? We, we knew who was being interviewed and when because in fact, the defense bar doesn't keep these things secret. Um, we knew there was litigation over, over uh, uh, various items. There were document production requests that we became aware of. In fact, these investigations, do you, I don't believe for a second that if Mark Meadows had, uh, had process to be in front of, uh, 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 the Justice Department's grand jury on this, that he wouldn't be, maybe he wouldn't be litigating it, but he would, uh, it would be known. We've not heard boo about. Well, uh, no, that's not we, right. We've heard about Rudy Giuliani. I mean, we've the, heard, again, we've the heard very that first were... thing, the very first thing Lisa Monaco did, and this was on her first day in the office, was approve a warrant for Rudy Giuliani for the Ukraine investigation. But, but again, as they, not a January 6th investigation. Except every single thing post January 1st, 2018 has been reviewed for privilege. The way they did the privilege review from the start was to say everything post January 1st, 2018, we will review for privilege. 
And it's clear that, and straight through, straight through April 28th, 2021. 20, so every single thing on Rudy Giuliani's devices, I, I promise you every single thing on there that pertains to January 6th has undergone a privilege review. Fair Everything. enough. But so, it was not so, collected pursuant to a subpoena in or, or to uh, a search warrant in this investigation. By the way, there's an obvious witness who would have no basis to resist an interview, and that's Mike Pence. Uh, there's no way that would be secret. And so I, I'm not saying that what you're saying is wrong. I'm yeah. saying that you're too confident that it's right. No, no, I mean, but but the other thing you're you're ignoring is Sidney Powell, right? That did leak. I, I do try. Leak. Let 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 that let let the record reflect that that's intentional. I try <laughs> very hard to ignore <laughs> Sidney Powell. Right, but but the thing about Sidney Powell is there was a reason, a, a way to predicate an investigation into Sidney Powell, Sidney Powell, which is that her grifting was potentially illegal, and so she was under investigation, and grand jury subpoenas were going out by September for Sidney Powell. So we know that they have Sidney Powell's comms. We know that they have Rudy Giuliani's comms. Uh, we know that Steve Bannon's under investigation on a Mueller referral um, and probably Paul Manafort on a Mueller referral. Um, but the other thing, Ben, that I think uh, people completely misunderstand about the Mueller investigation is that uh, one of, uh, Mueller did not say there was no conspiracy with Russia. On the day before the 2020 election, after years, Bill Barr declassified the note that made it clear that when Mueller shut down, there was an ongoing investigation into Roger Stone conspiring with Russia. And in April 2020, a bunch of warrants were unsealed that made it clear there was an entire investigation into Roger Stone, and they did it deliberately. They said Roger Stone thinks we're only investigating him about WikiLeaks and actually we're investigating him about his ties to Guccifer 2.0 from before Guccifer 2.0 was public. So that investigation you didn't know about. No one knew about. Everyone's like, OK, they've shut down. And that's one of the things that I think people misunderstand about Mueller is that Mueller, um, I think, rightly discovered that you could not conduct an investigation in public into these people. Uh, you could not conduct an investigation into Trump so long as he had pardon power. And uh, and lo and behold, we see that Trump's biggest donor, Tom Barah, is being prosecuted and probably along with him, Steve Bannon and Paul Manafort, because that case was preserved long enough that Trump couldn't pardon his way out of it. And if you read the Tom Barah case, he's sort of like, how dare they not indict me before I could be uh, before I could be pardoned. But that, but that's, I mean, that's a decision that Mueller made, a very concrete decision that Mueller made that he never gets credit for. Like he hid the investigation into Roger Stone. The entire Roger Stone trial, I promise you, was an effort to collect more evidence okay. in the larger investigation into Roger Stone. No one knows that. And so DOJ, including Molly Gaston, who is one of the key prosecutors who will be invest, who, who's overseeing the Bannon case, she knows this because she investigated the aftermath of the Mueller investigation. These people at DOJ know how not to conduct an investigation into Mueller. And so we shouldn't expect them to make the same mistakes or to, to have the same stumbles that Mueller had. So bringing up Mueller just very quickly, because again, it, I, I, I would like to ask a quick question and then I'd like Scott to ask a question and we have some really good audience questions. Um, the Mueller investigation, Mueller was extremely restrained in his report and part of that was because he wasn't sure whether or not you could charge a sitting president with obstruction charges and different things like that. And so I'm going to ask something slightly controversial to both of you. Even if we can prove that the actions of January 6th that Trump took were criminal, should we convict a ex-president? And I would like Marcy to go first and then Ben and then Scott, if you have a question, and this is really more of a philosophical question, uh, and then Scott, if you have a question, please go. <laughs> ben, you're muted. <laughs> yeah. Philosophy is stupid, so no. <laughs> I, I was going to say there's not going to be a lot of daylight between Marcy and me on this, I think. But, but but I don't want to presume. Go ahead, Marcy. No, I mean, you have to prosecute him. But I also think DOJ has ways of, I mean, the parts part of the Mueller investigation that people don't understand is that Trump 
was dangling a pardon to Julian Assange before he was president. And so that is not the action of a president. You know, if, if they can find a way to indict him for that, that's not charging a president. Trump has, I mean, one of the things they did in the Bannon contempt case is go back and pick up uh, the lawyer he shares communications going back to uh, the day that Bannon was pardoned for his other stuff. And there's no reason you do that unless you think there's a larger cover up between Trump and these key people like Bannon. So, you know, yes, I think Trump should must be charged for his actions in January 6th. I think Merrick Garland has said that you can, I mean, he, the OLC memo says that you can convict a president for conduct that was impeached but not prosecuted. So Merrick Garland, in, inv in invoking that, clearly believes you can prosecute him. But I also think there's other crimes um, that you can also prosecute Trump for that if you, you know, if that you, they probably would lard it on and say, here's the pre-2016 stuff that continued as a conspiracy until he pardoned everybody. And here's the post-2021 stuff that was post-president stuff. And here's the stuff we really need to prosecute, which is uh, January 6th. And oh, by the way, you know, the, the, the Giuliani Ukraine investigation gets right into Trump's conduct as well. Yeah, I can be really brief about this. I believe that Trump should be prosecuted for every single crime that the Justice Department can investigate in a fashion consistent with the Justice Manual and uh, whose prosecution is consistent with the Justice Manual, which is the sort of guidance they use for uh, um, and I, I think the, um, th look, I, I, I do believe the OLC memo that says you can't indict a sitting president is correct. Um, it's a, it's a complicated conversation. It's been the position of the executive branch since 1974. Uh, I think it's an inevitable position. Uh, but if you hold that position, and then you also say, as a prudential matter, we shouldn't prosecute presidents after they leave office. You really are saying that there are no circumstances in which a president should be prosecuted or can be prosecuted. That's untenable. Um, and, um, and I agree very much with Marcy that, you know, whether it rises to the, whether it meets the strict terms of the criminal law or not, Trump aimed a loaded machine gun at a coordinate branch of government with mm -hmm. that mob, and he tried to prevent the peaceful transition of power using a variety of means. What exactly is the criminal law for, if not to provide a remedy for that? And so, again, it doesn't answer the question, did he violate a criminal statute? There are a host of problems that you get into in that. But if you can prove it, if you can make that case, what what is the great equity that says, you know, you should hold your hand, hold, withhold the rod in that situation? I can't imagine what it would be. Scott, I know you have a question. Well, I, I, I would just say it, the, the issue is not the equity. The issue is just the kind of precedent that it sets that allows the, but, what, but what about no, no, the president no. in the other direction? Yeah, right. So the, the the point is is that it's better that one guy should get away with this crime than we create a retaliatory cycle of. How, how about how about this? I'm totally uh, down but, with that. But, but, Donald the way, Trump I, should appeal to Joe Biden for a pardon and say, "I am guilty, mea culpa. Can I be forgiven?" And I would say. Uh, that would be a, an act of grace on on Joe Biden's part. I would have no problem with his doing that, though I wouldn't personally do it myself. Um, uh, that's you know why the president has the pardon power to relieve exactly those political constraints. It just shouldn't be the 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 attorney general's job isn't to isn't to do that for the president. I don't know. I'm old fashioned. I, I would say that I were, yeah, I wasn't actually disagreeing with anybody here. I was just simply saying that I think 
you know, just uh, creating a weapon for 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 your political rivals to use. Uh, anyway, but but I, I just have a question: Is the difference? Is, let me see. I, I'm not sure I understand exactly where you guys differ. Is is the difference just whether Trump is a subject of an investigation or not? Where's Marcy? I, I think, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I think that is the issue that raised the difference but i think the difference is broader than that okay. i think marcy marcy has a coherent kind of th not quite 360 but 270 degree view of the investigation from having read every scrap of paper filed <laughs> in every case and mm. she is convinced that she has more visibility into the higher level decision making associated with the investigation than I am convinced the evidence that she presents supports. Um, and so I think she's definitely seeing some stuff and I think she's got, but one of the issues is whether Trump, Trump is under individual investigation. Another issue I think is how interlocking the conspiracies are in the minds of the department. I think there's a bunch of those. Yeah, issues. can I can I address the interlocking conspiracies? Because I go ahead actually and I meant to. I mean, look, there there are individual defendants, there are trespassers. All of them were part of the mob. None of them are charged in a conspiracy. Many of them, um, many, many, almost most, will say, I walked into that capital because Trump told me to. So that's an incitement model. That is the incitement model that uh, Judge Mehta has already said is plausible for Trump. Judge Mehta, the most surprising thing Judge Mehta said in ruling for the Thompson suit is that Trump has an aid and a bet liability for the assaults at the Capitol. And that is mind blowing and hasn't gotten enough attention. So Judge Mehta, who is presiding over some of the really interesting assault cases in addition to the Oath Keeper case. Um, so some of the Oath Keepers are accused of assault, but also like, remember the cop from the NYPD who seemed to gouge out somebody's eyes? His name is Webster. Um, that's a Meta case. Uh, another case is this um, felon who was out on COVID release, who didn't go to the didn't go to the rally at all. Just went straight to the riot and started rioting. Um, Judge Meta case. And in those cases, these people are saying, "I I went to the Capitol and assaulted cops because Donald Trump told me to." And Judge Meta said, "Yeah, you know, I think that um, Trump really knew that he was going to get violence when he told people to go and fight for themselves." With respect to the conspiracies, I think that the model is that Trump is a conspirator, is a hypothetical conspirator with every one of these conspiracies. I've said already that the Proud Boys and the Oath Keepers, we know that they were coordinating. There are multiple overlap people between them. We know that um, we know that Roger Stone was coordinating with them. We know that like that that was the gun that Roger Stone was holding in his hand, shooting at the Capitol. Um, but it's not just Roger Stone, it's Alex Jones, it's also Rudy Giuliani. He had comms with some Proud Boys. So, um, but then there are these other conspiracies and those are the ones I actually love. Like there's this conspiracy of three guys who met online and in response to Trump's November, uh, December 19th tweet where he said, gonna be wild. Like that tweet was one of the most important events in the entire riot. And you can probably find 300 charged defendants who took action in response to that tweet on December 19th. New York Times wrote a piece about it recently. Um, so these three guys respond to that, to that December 19th tweet. They, they, they're they like, Trump has told us to come. We have to come. Like he's their best friend. Mm -hmm. And so they go on Amazon. They spend $300 arming themselves, body armor, guns. They meet in Memphis or Tennessee somewhere and drive to DC together. These guys have never met before. Uh, one of them brings a gun into DC. And they have no means to coordinate with the militia. They have no means to be tactically important. Mm -hmm. But they went to the rally on, on January 5th. And there was a lot that, I mean, DOJ is investigating January 5th uh, very closely, but what they're seeing is not very public yet. Um, but they went to the rally on January 5th. And my guess is that they learned what was going to go on the next day on January 5th because they were tactically critical. Like they were tactically uh, they were part of the assault that opened the East door. They were part of an assault that opened the Senate. 
Uh, one of the three members, the cooperating member is that guy who repelled from the um, gallery in the Senate down to the floor. They were everywhere you wanted to be if your objective was to kill Mike Pence. And there's no, like somehow they became a perfect weapon. Um, and there are multiple, like there's another case, there's the anti-mask community in Southern California. We know that their funder, who by the way, has been under investigation since June, uh, he had his devices taken in June, their funder and one of the key militia overlap people was in DC in December at the MAGA rally in December. And that was another key organizing moment for the tactical organizers. And so they went back to LA, they all did anti-mask protests together. These militia overlap people said, here's how we're gonna do the riot in, in January. And so then these morons from California end up being practically important. There's over and over, that's how this thing happened. Is, is it a unified conspiracy? Absolutely not. So Marcy, uh, this discussion of the conspiracies and the threads actually leads me to a question from one of our audience members. So Javelin, would you like to ask your question? The floor is yours. Yeah, absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Hey, so the question is, so last month, DOJ, I think, asked for an enhancement of 120 prosecutors. Javelin sounds an awful lot like Pete Strzok. Not, there's <laughs> no puppet uh, moving its <laughs> mouth, right? And then the, um, to my knowledge, the FBI has not asked for any additional resources. Given it's 14 <laughs> months after the fact, given that I think there is a judge, I don't know if it's McFadden, but at least one judge has indicated he is not inclined to toll the Speedy Trial Act and may cause real problems with at least one prosecution. Does this late or non-existent request for resources reflect either a lack of urgency or a lack of understanding of the scope of the investigation in front of the FBI and DOJ? I have yet to see the actual quote that says that all 151 of those new prosecutors are gonna be January 6th prosecutors. I just think that, gen that, that DOJ as a whole is incredibly taxed. Um, but I also think that the, the you, I mean, you tell me, right? But I think that the kind of investigation is shifting. Like they're getting cooperating witnesses now they're getting, um, yes, they are serving subpoenas on the white collar criminals involved in this. Um, yes, they're, they're, they're going to start seizing devices that they actually have to get into in addition to Enrique Tarios. I mean, that, uh, they, they, they appear to have waited to open a second major grand jury for cracking Enrique Tarios' phone. Like, and so there was a three week de delay between February 14th and, and March 7th, while they were getting that grant, they were reading that, that grand jury, the, the, the January 8th grand jury has become the February 14th, 2022 grand jury. And that grand jury is going to see everything. So your question about are these, are these conspiracies interlocking? It's one grand jury that is seeing every single conspiracy case and every major, you know, every major uh, uh, defendant. Um, so yeah, I don't know whether FBI has the resources. I, I suspect you also know that they've been relying heavily on task force officers in the localities. So, so I just want to I, I just want to point out that there's a, a, a interesting process uh, point in some things that Marcy has just said uh, uh, in response to my absence of interlocking conspiracy indictments uh, point. One way you will know over the next year if Marcy is correct is that you'll start seeing indictments that are bringing these conspiracies into the same indictment. Um, you know, are there indictments that reflect uh, some of the points that Marcy is making inferentially, or do they remain logical inferences, but unindicted inferences, right? Do you see a a point at which Roger Stone's relationships, uh, Alex Jones's relationships in, in moving some of these people in coordinating some of this come to be reflected in, uh, in indictments. And at what point does, uh, do you start seeing 
references to the activities of senior White House leadership or uh, as opposed to merely uh, uh, statements of, you know, informational statements from uh, from defendants saying, hey, I was here at the call of the president. So one of the one of the interesting things about Marcy's well, thesis you've already is that, seen it, that because Trump's tweet, Trump, I would you consider Trump a, a senior White House? Yeah, I think the president counts as a senior okay. White House. So official. Trump's tweet and Trump's comments about Pence were, I, you know, would they they were how you load that gun. No, no, and there's no, abundant you evidence. You don't have that. to persuade me yeah. about the fact that there right. was that Trump was doing. My question is about the Justice Department's investigation. And right now, there is not an indictment that brings these conspiracies together that says the Oath Keeper. The Oath Keeper does. No, no, no. The Oath Keeper's indictment goes as high as Stuart Rhodes. No. Okay. So understand that the, the Rhodes indictment. Uh, they started, and at that point, they must have known that Joshua James was going to flip. Uh, they have four, at least four cooperating witnesses against Roger Stone, and Roger Stone has been built into those cases from March. So over a year ago, Roger Stone has been a part of these investigations. And then with the, with the Stuart Rhodes, what they did is they took the commentary about what happened at the Willard, and they hit it. Right. They so put it I, on ice. All, all I'm saying is when it comes off ice, when you yeah. start seeing indictments about the Willard, bringing these right now relatively segregated things that you're criticizing a lot of you know, TV lawyers like me, right. not that I go on TV anymore, for not connecting, when there are indictments that connect them, that would they do. Be... I mean, that's what that's what Joshua James. I mean, there are two cooperating oath keep, keeper witnesses who were at the Willard, and Joshua James is important not just because he's very important to get to Stuart Rhodes, but he's important because he was reporting back. He was reporting back from Stone. He was calling in about how pissed off Stone was about not being made a VIP, and what James would have given in cooperation is the content of that coordination between Roger Stone and the, the guy, his name is Mike Simmons, the guy who was the operational commander for the Oath Keepers that day, and, and Kelly Meggs, who's a good buddy of Roger Stone's. Um, and then three of the other Oath Keeper, cooperating Oath Keepers are from Florida and had were part of this alliance that was formed in December. So we know that they were working with Stone in December. And if you're working with Stone, you're also working with Ali Alexander. So we know that to be a fact. So Scott, you had something you'd yeah. like to say. Yeah. yeah, so I just want to say that <clears throat> what, what I'm hearing is, is that like, so the facts seem to be uh, to be that it seemed to be consistent with a pattern of charging that connects the conspiracies together, but then will also then lead to Trump. The question become the question here. It seems to me now. Just correct me if I'm wrong. Is whether what you're seeing is like what Neptune was? It was like you you felt the gravitational force of it, but you couldn't yet see it. Um, and so, and and that there's precedent for there being indictments that haven't been made public, um, or do you want to be like Ben, who says like it's completely plausible that that's happened, but it's also completely plausible that the, they're just setting, they're giving themselves room to do it if they need to do it. Um, so or, or even that they've indicted 700 people, they've prosec they're prosecuted right. 800 people, and they're and this may or may not lead to a whole lot more. Right, and, and so you can have one case where they're connected, uh, where some connected, but without it being the case that you see all this pattern coming together. But it is really possible that. Um, no decision has been made yet, and they're just keeping their options open. Is, is that not possible? That's actually yeah, I mean, what I believe. 
No, I know. Yeah, That's, I, think, I was making. I was making. This I, case, but... I think that. Um, I think that the place to look is the way in which DOJ is prioritizing the emphasis on Mike Pence. So there is a slew, including that the those three guys who met in Tennessee and drove together. There is a slew of evidence that they have collected that the goal, one way or another, for all of these people at the Capitol was to not just threaten Mike Pence, but some of them, uh, there's reason to believe that the Oath Keepers went to hunt him down, and they probably weren't the only ones. And so, for example, Matthew Green, the one over Proud Boy cooperator, said, our purpose, the reason we got so close to the, he's like the schlub of the Proud Boys, like he wasn't close to the top, but he is their way of demonstrating that he was following the orders of Enrique Tarrio and Joe Biggs. And he said, our purpose, the reason we trespassed is because we wanted to apply maximum pressure on Mike Pence. Um, the anti-masker, same thing, you know, she repeats Trump's Pence attacks and then goes to the Capitol and repeats Pence attacks. And so I, I think that, you know, the, the John Eastman stuff is important because we see the background, we see the strategy, the decision made to, to threaten Pence, right? And to, and to um, threaten Pence in real time. Those emails go back and forth from John Eastman and to, to Greg, J Greg Jacob. And Greg, J Greg Jacob, Jacob, Pence's lawyer, has this great comment where he says, because you lied to these people and made them believe that, that they could legitimately change this election, you created this mob. We're under siege. You caused this. And uh, and that is Pence's counsel who, from the Capitol, tied the mobilization of the mob to this attack, to the endangerment of Mike Pence on that day. And so I don't see, I mean, it is reality that everyone was targeting Mike Pence, but the way in which DOJ is collecting the focus from, I don't know, 400, let's say, no, that's probably, I'd say 150 people. So maybe a quarter of the people they've charged, they've got them trying to kill, threaten, or or bring Mike Pence to justice. And, and there are multiple ways you can prove that that was done as a result of actions that Trump took or that the, that the militias took. So I wanted to bring Jacob on for our last audience question. Jacob, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you. Uh, all right. So I understand your frustration with do something Twitter um, because clearly things are being done. Um, my cons and also I'm an attorney, so uh, you know I, I understand that the wheels of justice and the wheels of law turn very, very slowly. My and 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 I'm and I'm sorry. Hmm, sorry. Oh. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> you know, my, that uh, was and, good. And, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I'm curious as to what your response uh, for those who are concerned that should the Republicans take the House in the midterms this year, and you know, heavens forbid, they take the the uh, Senate in the midterms this year. Uh, are there concerns that they're going to start uh, interfering with these investigations and that there really is a bit of a, a time limit for these to uh, get through? I think they're right. I mean, I, you know, I'm not, I don't want to lie to people. I don't want to say that Trump is going to be in prison by 2022 or even 2024, because even if they do charge him, that case will go on forever. Um, but one of the reasons I'm so impatient with do something Twitter is every minute somebody is on Twitter saying do something is a minute that they're not out knocking doors, is a minute that they're not out running for a uh, school board, is a minute that they're not out just trying to talk to their neighbors. And so there are a few things that, are, uh, that make someone more helpless than sitting on Twitter saying, why won't Merrick Garland do anything? Particularly because Merrick Garland is doing stuff, but I promise you that um, the Steve Bannon indictment, by the way, is due in June, so we may get rid of Steve Bannon then. Um, but that's in, in the in the Barack case. Um, but uh, but um, Merrick Garland's not going to put Trump away in time for this schedule. 
So we can't rely on Merrick Garland alone. I promise that that is not going to be enough. Um, and that's, you know, that's unfortunate, but that is, you know, a lot of people like, a lot of people are like, why can't, why can't Merrick Garland move faster? And I'm like, you know, it took a year for DOJ to crack Enrique Tadio's phone and give it a filter review. Mm -hmm. um, you can't accelerate that process. And Enrique Tadio is one of the key pivot points in this investigation that gets you, I mean, that is why, that is one of two or three reasons why DOJ is now going to start snowballing into the organizers because Tadio had ties to all of them. And all of those comms were on his phone but they didn't get those comms until mid mid january ben would you like to reply as well yeah so i leaving tario aside i completely agree with this um i think uh it's uh first of all people who think the justice department hasn't done anything just don't understand the way federal investigations work this is 800 indictments in a year some of them seditious conspiracy indictments you know that's in 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 normal justice department fbi speak that's moving unbelievably quickly um and you know so uh, for, first of all I mean, the premise is wrong right what 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 the the, the premise means Merrick Garland hasn't, you know, kind of person and Chris Ray haven't personally gone into Mar-a-Lago, kicked down the door and dragged the former president. I mean, okay, I understand that people want things, to, <coughs> excuse me, to go at the speed of a movie, but that's not the way the Justice Department works. It's not the way the FBI works. And actually, it's not the way you would work if you were running a department that knew it was going to have to litigate every comma of every, you know, every page, every comma, every sentence, every every time an FBI agent went to the bathroom, you were going to have to account for that in a litigation, and maybe John Durham would swoop in and try to investigate it. I mean, it's a this is a nightmare of a case, and the only way to handle it. And by the way, we, you know, when I was a young reporter, uh, I actually watched Merrick Garland run the uh, 1996 to 1995 uh, uh, Oklahoma City bombing case. And, you know, the promise that they made in that case was that they were going to do that investigation so perfectly that every aspect of it stood up in court. And they did it. And that's what they're trying to do here. So I think the premise that they're not doing anything is just garbage. And the idea that it's gonna it's gonna proceed at a it's actually a lightning pace. It feels like a plotting pace. Um and um but you know I agree with Marcy that that people it's not that you should be patient. You should have some idea when you go on television about what uh, what a complex federal investigation actually looks like. So I, yeah, I don't think there's daylight between us on that. Thank you all very, very much. It is now 6.02 and it is very, very late in Ireland. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so thank you for staying up with us, Marcy. We really appreciate it. And yeah. you, can, you can vote on, on who you think prevailed in this slugfest in the poll. Um, Marcy, you're a great American for joining us, or a great Irish person. Uh... <laughs> so we will be back on Friday at 5 p.m. I don't know what Friday's show will be, um, but that is many hours and some minutes from the, now. And until then, Ben? We don't have fun anymore, but we do have uh, uh, slugfests that aren't really slugfests about interesting issues on which uh, uh, reasonable people disagree and uh, can do so uh, with amused uh, 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 amused engagement with one another.